Welcome back, everyone, to Lecture 2. Today we're going to talk about the infectious cycle. This is what happens when a virus attach and get into a cell, how we study it and all the events that are happening. And we'll talk about a little bit about methods today because this is important and particularly important for SARS-CoV-2, as we have learned in the past year. The infectious cycle means everything that happens in a virus-infected cell from attachment and entry to the production of new virus particles. That's the infectious cycle. Sometimes it's called the reproduction cycle. Same thing, synonymous. And we divide this, virologists divide this into steps just to make it easier to study them or highlight them. So we talk about attachment and entry of viruses to receptors. We talk about uh, macromolecular processes like translation and genome replication. Uh, and assembly and release, right? And we're, we actually have lectures in this course that are based on these divisions. We have an attachment and entry lecture and so forth. Uh, and w the, the, the purpose of dividing it is, as I said, so we can study them. And this is a generic, or this is a replication cycle of a very specific virus. And you can see it's happening all in the cytoplasm, but many viruses are also in the nucleus as well, as you will learn throughout this course. So that's the infectious cycle. And before we go any further, I need to define some terms because the terms I use are often different from the rest of the world. And since you're in a virology course, uh, you need to know them. So here, susceptible cell. When I talk about a susceptible cell, what I mean is that the cell has a receptor for a virus, all right? The, the cell may not be able to actually reproduce the virus. Susceptibility only implies attachment. So this has to do with the cell. Obviously, a, an animal, a person, or some other host for a virus, you, we call them susceptible to infection. It's different. We don't mean receptors in an animal. This is at the single cell level, all right? So susceptible has a functional receptor. And so the two pictures at the top right show you susceptible cells uh, on the left, the virus is attaching and, and uh, to that cell. And it's also replicating, which is a separate definition. But on the right, here's a cell where the virus attaches and may even get in, but it doesn't reproduce. They're both susceptible because they have receptors, okay? A resistant cell uh, has no receptor. And here are some resistant cells. The receptor is not on the surface. It's very small here, but there's a little colored box there under the virus. There's no receptor on the second two cells. Doesn't matter if these are able to support replication or not, or not the virus could never get in. And then we have permissive cell. This is a cell that has the capacity to replicate a virus. It may or may not be susceptible. It may or may not have um, recept receptors for the virus, right? So here are two suscept uh, permissive cells, the third row of cells. The one on the right has a receptor. It's also susceptible. So the virus can bind and get in and reproduce. But the one on the left doesn't have a receptor. So you may ask, how can the virus reproduce in it? Well, the only way it will is if you artificially introduce nucleic acid in the laboratory into the cell. You bypass the receptor. When you put nucleic acid into cells, a process we call transfection, that bypasses the need for a receptor. And then you can tell if the internal environment of a cell is permissive for virus replication. So susceptible and permissive are two key definitions. And I tell you, most virologists don't even use them properly. And the only reason I do is because 20 years ago, I wrote a textbook and I had to make it clear what we were talking about. But they're important definitions. And finally, a susceptible and permissive cell is the only one that can both take up a virus, the virus can bind to it, and the virus can get into cells and replicate it. All right, it's really important definitions, and, and we're going to use them a lot. And the, the whole idea of receptors and entry and, and permissivity, we're going to cover in, in great detail uh, in this course. Now, remember, yes, the, to Monday, we talked about virus discovery in um, the late 1800s, early 1900s. For years, we couldn't grow viruses in cells and culture because we didn't know how to do cell culture in the laboratory. That didn't come out until... 40s and 50s, actually. We'll, we'll talk a little bit about that today. But we had to use animals of various sorts, like 
chickens and ferrets and rabbits and non-human primates, et cetera, rodents, dogs, cats, whatever people could get their virus to grow in. And they would make stocks of viruses in animals. For example, polio virus for many years after its discovery in 1908, people made stocks of the virus by inoculating non-human primates. As soon as they got paralyzed, they'd remove the brain and spinal cord, grind it up, and, that, and they froze it. And that was their stocks. Actually, they didn't freeze it because there were no freezers. So what would they do? They would inoculate another animal. And they kept doing that to maintain the stocks of viruses. Can you imagine? Freezers came about much later. And that actually was bad because if you keep passing a virus in what is not its normal host, you can select for variants. You could also use plants or insects, whatever the host of the virus was, were, were. You would make your stocks in them. And for many years, there was no cell culture. But eventually, we... Um, learned how to make cell cultures. Now, a, an interesting uh, development uh, in the th 30s was that you could infect eggs with some viruses, embryonated eggs, of course. If there's no embryo in the egg, good luck getting your virus to replicate in the yolk and the, and the white of the egg. But here's an embryonated, embryonated chicken egg. It has a tiny embryo. This is about 12 to 13 days uh, after fertilization. And the egg, of course, has a variety of different compartments with fluids. The, the fluid right around the embryo there is the uh, amniotic fluid, and it's the amniotic cavity. There's the allantoic cavity, the blue, which has got allantoic fluid in it. And there are various membranes. And when you inoculate viruses, they can grow in different kinds of cells. And you can see the needles here. We're putting viruses into different parts of the egg. I have had a lot of experience with allantoic inoculation because you can grow influenza viruses, and we still do that to this day. And in fact, many of the vaccines, influenza vaccines, are grown in eggs to this day because you can make a lot. You can get a lot of eggs, and it's easy to do it. You, I'm going to show you in a slide, I believe. Uh, we, we use uh, almost 150, 200 million eggs a year growing flu vaccines. One uh, shot. You go get a flu vaccine. If it was grown in eggs, it, it's usually one egg's worth of virus. And you get about 10 mLs of uh, allantoic fluid. So you can inoculate your virus. And to do that, you have to drill a hole in the shell, of course. You put a needle in and you get very good at being able to put the needle in the right place. And then the virus grows and then you harvest the fluid. So here's how today's uh, many of today's flu vaccines are actually grown in eggs, chicken eggs, embryonated chicken eggs, huge uh, numbers, as I said, and there are machines that um, drill holes in the eggs. Here's the top of the egg. So if you remember, the top of the egg has a has an air sac. So you, you drill a hole there, and that way when you inject fluid, it doesn't come right back out at you, right? Because the air sac gives you a little play there. And so here's an, an automated injector putting virus. And so these eggs on racks go through Machines that drill holes and they inject virus and then the hole is sealed with a little wax and it's put in an incubator. Look at this, racks and racks of eggs. Uh, but um, And many other viruses could be grown in eggs for years. Nowadays, only influenza virus is grown in eggs. But the whole topic of today, studying this infectious cycle, wasn't possible before 1949, at least for animal viruses. And that's the year when three scientists, Anders Weller and Robbins, figured out that you could grow poliovirus in cells in culture. And they used primary cultures of uh, human embryonic tissues. Um, they, they would take the cells and put them in, in culture, make monolayers of them. We'll see how that works in a moment. And they found that you could grow poliovirus in them. And uh, they got the Nobel Prize for this in 1954. It was a huge discovery. John Enders here, cover of Time magazine. Medicine gains on viruses, huh? I think this. Uh, I think this is nineteen sixty something. So this was a landmark discovery, and after that point, everyone started using cell cultures to study their viruses, and we stopped passing viruses uh, in animals. And today, we use very specific kinds of cell cultures. We have primary cell cultures, and these are human foreskin fibroblasts. And you may ask why. Foreskin fibroblasts, well, you can go to any hospital and any given day, someone's going to be born and you can get foreskins because they're thrown away. Otherwise, you can take them 
and bring them back to your lab. You mince them up and you trypsinize them to make single cells and the cells will attach to a plastic monolayer. You feed them with medium and they will grow. Not forever, but long enough to do some virus experiments. Then we have cell lines. Cell lines are immortal. They grow forever. Like this mouse fibroblast cell line, a famous one called 3T3. We have the HeLa cell line, a human epithelial cell line, which is immortal. These are called continuous cell lines. Now, they're great because they grow forever. You can put them in the freezer and go back to them and get more of them. We have had HeLa cells in my lab since the 80s when I started my lab. And uh, they're great, but they're weird. They're abnormal. They have the wrong number of chromosomes. And, you know, they have multiple copies of chromosomes. They're, they're not right in any way. So you, it's a trade-off. And today we try and use other cell, other types of cultures, as you'll see in a moment, uh, when we want to get closer to where the virus actually reproduces. So uh, the HeLa cells were derived from a um, cervical cancer, Right. And we use them for all kinds of viruses. I use them for poliovirus, but poliovirus does not rep reproduce in the cervix of humans. So it's an abnormal cell for the virus. So you can only do so much in them. Um, and you cannot grow vaccines in these cell lines because they actually, if injected into an animal, they can cause a tumor uh, because they're transformed. And we'll talk about that in a separate lecture. So you have to use other kinds of cell lines. You either use primary cells to grow vaccines, not foreskin cells. You'd be needing a lot of foreskins to make vaccines, uh, but you can use monkey kidney cells or other sorts of primary cells, or you can use cell strains. These are cells that grow for longer than primary cells. So a primary cell line will grow for maybe 30 divisions and then it dies and you have to start again. And these diploid strains can go up to 100 or more and they're not transformed, they're not immortal, so you can grow vaccines in them. So in our lab, we grow lots of cells and we grow them on plastic surfaces in dishes like on the right here, these are six centimeter dishes in the back, 10 centimeter. We have flasks also we can grow them in or six well plates, all different uh, confirmations, depending on what you want to do. But they're all, these are all cases where the cells are sticking to the plastic. Sometimes you want to grow huge quantities of cells, and we do that in what we call a spinner, and that's on the right here. And that's very few cell lines will grow in suspension, but this one is HeLa cells. Uh, they happen to do it, and we used to use uh, many of those. Here you have a liter of HeLa cells, and there are about 100,000 HeLa cells per milliliter. So a lot of cells, you can only have a few million in each of these plates. So um, this is a magnet here that is spinning. There's a stir plate below it and it keeps the cells suspended. Now, HeLa cells, of course, uh, were the subject of this book by Rebecca Sklute, The Immortal Life of Henrietta Lacks. It was then a movie, right? Um, and this um, was a story of a woman who had developed a cervical tumor in 1950. And when she went for her first exam, the doctor took a piece out of the tumor without telling her and, and he made HeLa cells and they were the first immortal cell line. Uh, but he he didn't tell her and she died and her family found out many years later and they were very upset about this. And the book is the story of uh, that. And I worked with uh, Rebecca Sklute a bit on the book and you can find my name in the book a couple of times. It's a very cool story. <clears throat> Today, we have other kinds of cell cultures. So, so far, I've told you about cell cultures where you put the cells on a plastic surface and they, they fill the plate. They become confluent, we say, so that the cells are all packed next to each other and then you can infect them with your viruses. But now we can make different kinds of cell cultures that are more similar to what is in an an, a, an organism, like a human or a, some other kind of animal. So for example, we can make organoid cultures. We have an embryonic stem cell, which is retrieved from a blastocyst. So that's a stem cell that can become anything, depending on how you grow. You can treat it with different growth factors and so forth to make it differentiate into different things. And here, for example, we can differentiate these into gastric organoids, they're called, little organs. They're not really a stomach, but they have many properties of how the cells are organized, livers, liver organized, lungs and intestinal. And you can use these to more approximate where your virus reproduces. And on the bottom, uh, you can actually take a somatic cell. This is amazing. 
that. You can take a somatic cell, you put three plasmids in it, and it becomes an induced pluripotent stem cell. And, and whenever you see stem cell, it means you can become a lot of other cell types. You can take a skin cell from you or a blood cell and make it immortal. You make it a stem cell, and then you can differentiate it into any of these other organoids here, like optic cup, cortical, inner ear, pituitary organoids, whatever you want. It's just a matter of finding the conditions to incubate these stem cells to get them to differentiate. So then you can see where your virus infects and what it does and so forth. And many of these organoids don't have immune systems and people are working on trying to introduce immune systems into them because you know, an organoid is great for seeing what cells are infected by your virus, but there's no immune system. So it's completely artificial and immune system modulates what, what's going on. And then finally on the right, another example of a cool kind of cell culture. This is an air-liquid interface culture to approximate the respiratory tract. As you will see, many people use Vero cells to study SARS-CoV-2. Vero is a kidney cell from a vervet monkey, completely irrelevant to SARS-CoV-2. And in fact, it does, the virus does weird things in them. So what do you want to do is study them in an air-liquid interface culture. You take you could take a bit of uh, epithelium from the airway of a human or an animal and you put them in a culture. It's a culture dish, which is slightly different because there's a membrane uh, at the bottom there and the membrane is permeable. So the cells form a monolayer on them. And then what you do is you take the, the medium off and the cells go, air, we're back in air again. <laughs> and they differentiate because that's what they do when they, in, in the respiratory tract, they're exposed to air on one side and fluid on the other. So now they differentiate into mucus producing cells, you know, uh, the, the ones with cilia on them and so forth. So it becomes approximation of a respiratory tract. So you can infect this uh, with your virus and understand what's going on. So very exciting uh, developments in cell culture. A blank and blank cell is the only cell that can take up a virus particle and replicate it. So if we have to fill in the blanks, we have a couple of possibilities here. Naive and resistant, primary and permissive, susceptible and permissive, susceptible and naive, continuous and immortal. <clears throat> Most of you, 92% of you got C, susceptible and permissive, right? A susceptible and permissive cell is the only one that can take up a virus. So nobody got A, which is good. Some of you said primary and permissive. So primary simply refers to uh, making a cell from a, an organ. So that is not really telling you about whether the virus can reproduce in it. Some of you picked susceptible and naive. Naive is not the word, one of the words I gave you, susceptible, permissive, and continuous and immortal. No, because those are properties of cells that live forever, but they don't tell you anything about susceptibility and uh, permissivity. You have a monolayer of cells. You infect with the virus. How do you know the virus is doing anything in them? Well, one way you can tell is by what we call cytopathic effect or CPE. And I'll talk about this a lot in this course. Here's an example. These are cells from my lab. Uh, these are uh, actually mouse cells, a continuous uh, line of mouse cells where we've put in the gene for the human polio receptor. So they become susceptible to polio virus. So mouse cells are already permissive. If you put the viral RNA into mouse cells, it will reproduce, but they're not susceptible. They don't have a receptor. But here we've put the receptor gene in and uh, we've infected these cells and this is time zero. And then four hours later, you can see cells are starting to round up, right? That's kind of cytopathic effect. Then eight hours later, most of the cells are floating and rounded up. And then by 12 hours, many of them have broken. So rounding up, detachment, lysing, those are all cytopathic effects. In fact, there are many kinds of cytopathic effects uh, that we'll look at in a moment. But I wanted to show you, put this into context. Uh, way back in January 2020, as we were just beginning this course, SARS-CoV-2 was identified. And here's the paper that was originally published to describe it, but it was perfect timing for this lecture, a pneumonia outbreak associated with a new coronus, coronavirus of probable bat origin. Uh, this is from Zhang Li Shi's lab in the uh, Wuhan Institute of Virology. And he, here we report the identification and characterization of the new coronavirus, which they called originally 2019 NCoV, and the name is now changed, of course. How did they do this? We successfully isolated the virus in Vero, 
and HUH7. HUH7 is a liver cell line, so both irrelevant, but they can grow the virus, so okay. Using BALF sample, uh, bronchoalveolar lavage fluid. So they put a tube into the patient. So these are patients with pneumonia in, in Wuhan. They're in the hospital. They intubate them. They put the tube all the way down uh, into the, the bronchi and the alveoli. That's bronchial alveolar lavage. They put fluid in, like saline, and then uh, they remove it. And the idea is you're rinsing the area. And if there's virus in it, you're going to get it out. And then they put the BALF sample from one patient onto a monolayer of cells. And the monolayer is shown on the left at time zero or uninfected. Nice monolayer. And then uh, at three days after infection, look at we have cytopathic effect on the right. So this is a great example of how you can use cytopathic effect to see if your virus, if there's a virus there. And they probably came in that morning and looked at it and go, wow. Well, they didn't say wow because they're in China, but they were probably really excited that they got a viral CPE. It's only usually viruses do this. And you have a control uh, from, say, a normal patient if you're lucky and, and that wouldn't cause any CPE. So that was the first hint that there was a virus there. And we'll follow that up later today with more information. So cells rounding up, detaching, that's one kind of cytopathic effect. Sometimes viruses cause fusion of cells, and that's called syncytia, right? A very specific word. So a virus infecting a cell causes viral proteins to be displayed uh, on the surface of the cell. And uh, those can often induce fusion. As we'll see when we talk about virus entry, those viral proteins have a role in membrane fusion. But if two cells are infected and displaying the proteins, the two cells can fuse. And many cells can actually fuse and form one giant cell with a lot of nuclei. That's called a syncytium. Syncytia is plural. And here's a, a photograph, a light microscopic photograph of a culture of cells infected with measles virus, which is a virus known to cause syncytia. And you can see individual cells, but look, here are these giant cells with lots of nuclei. And actually, if you suspect someone to have measles, they often have these uh, white dots in their mouth. You can scrape them and look at them and you will find syncytia. It's kind of a quick way of saying mm, measles might be here. So there are many different kinds of cytopathic effects. I don't want you to remember what these are. Just understand that it's the virus reproducing in the cell and causing the cell to be different in some way that you can recognize in a light microscope or perhaps by staining the cell. So here we have a table of the different kinds of cytopathic effects and the viruses that do them. And you know we've talked about syncytium formation, rounding up and detachment of cells, and many viruses do that. Um, you know, chromosomes can break up. You can see virus particles in the nucleus or the cytoplasm clumps of ribosomes of virions, all these are cytopathic effects. So they tell you that your virus is, is reproducing in the cell. The next question you often have is, well, okay, we've infected this cell. How many viruses are in our sample when the cell is finished producing viruses? And you can measure infectivity or you can measure uh, physical virus particles or their components. And I want to go through some of the assays for that. And this is a picture of um, my laboratory uh, which and these are all vials full of viruses sitting out, and obviously many of them are going to be discarded. But uh, you know they're they're from experiments, and people are trying to quantify infectivity. So how do you do that? Well, the plaque assay is a very old method for measuring viral infectivity. It was originally used in the 1930s to study bacteriophages, and here we have a lawn of bacteria on a petri dish. And these clearings are plaques caused by the bacteriophages which have killed and lysed the bacteria. So the killing of the bacteria makes a clearing on the monolayer, which you can see, and you can count it, and you can quantify the number of infectious virus particles. In uh, 1952, this virologist, Renato Dulbeco, took that plaque assay and modified it for animal viruses. And this was one of the reasons why he received the Nobel Prize in 1975. We'll actually come back to his Nobel Prize because it had some other people in it that were very important for other reasons. So here's the paper, 1952. It's from Caltech. Production of plaques in monolayer tissue cultures by single particles of an animal virus. And here's the picture from the paper. And I'm going to show you some really nice plaque pictures now. So, But this was old. That's okay. And I want to explain how he knows that a single particle can make a plaque. So here's how you do a plaque assay. 
learn this, okay? Because it's usually always on the first exam and 20% of the people get it wrong. It's not hard. So check it out. You'd have a, a tube of virus. I hand you a tube of virus. And then I say to you, how many, how many infectious virus particles are in it? So what you do is you make dilutions. You set up a series of tubes here. You put 0.9 ml of medium, like PBS or, or medium. And then you take 0.1 ml of your virus. You put it in the first tube. You mix it up. You take 0.1 ml out of that and so on. You're doing serial tenfold dilutions, right? Minus one, minus two, three, four, all the way to 10 to the minus seven dilution. That's the dilution factor. And then you take monolayers of cells, you remove the medium, and you infect them with 0.1 ml of each dilution. And that adds you another tenfold dilution. So the final dilution, you know, is minus six, minus seven, minus eight. And then you, you do a plaque assay, you add an agar overlay to the cells, and that uh, keeps the virus from moving throughout the whole culture. If you put a liquid overlay on this, as soon as the first cells were infected, the virus would spread to all the cells and kill them all. But here we put an agar overlay on so it restricts the movement of the virus. And after a few days, you can get plaques like these and you pick one where you have a good number that you can count. These are too many on the left. They're too few on the right to be significant. So here's 17. And the titer of virus in this sample then, we count 17 plaques here. We apply the dilutions of minus six and another one minus seven. And then we move the decimal point over. So we have 17 times 10 to the seventh or 1.7 times 10 to the eight plaque forming units per mil. So that's what we're looking at. We have, we're looking at a virus or some kind of unit, obviously the virus, that can make a plaque on the monolayer. And we're, we're telling you there are 1.7 times 10 to the eighth of those in a milliliter of virus stock. So that's the titer. It's an infectivity assay because the virus is reproducing and making a plaque uh, in the cells. So here's a, a microscopic look at what's going on. Here's our monolayer that we've infected. Again, we put an auger overlay on it. Uh, one cell here is infected and the cell lyses and it's gone, but it releases virus particles which infect the neighboring cells and they get infected. The hole gets bigger and bigger. And eventually you can see it with the naked eye. And again, the agar on the monolayer restricts virus movement to just neighboring cells instead of the virus going throughout the monolayer. And here on the left, uh, sometimes in many cases we can see the plaques and we stain them we stain the monolayers blue, for example, with crystal violet, and we see the holes where there was no cell. And I'll show you a photograph of that in a moment. But some viruses, in some cases, we can put a gene in the virus that gives you a color. So here, for example, is a plaque caused by a herpes virus. We're looking at it under the microscope. And you can see dead cells in the center of the plaque. And on the right, uh, we have uh, stained for the, the gene product, uh, and it's blue. And you can see that the, the viruses forming the plaque make a blue plaque, basically. So there are many ways that you can quantify this. And here's a movie of plaque formation. Let me stop it and start at the beginning. Nope, that's the wrong slide. So what they did here, they took a, a monolayer of cells and they infected them with vaccinia virus, which is a pox virus related to smallpox virus. And then they incubated for a while, and then they looked where there was the beginning of a plaque, and then they put a, the, the camera on, on the microscope over, and they did time lapse. They took a frame every every minute or so, and this goes up to many hours, as you'll see on the counter. And so this is a time lapse photograph, and watch. You see the plaque is getting bigger and bigger as the cells are dying. It's like, um, how did that go, 15 hours or so it went up to? Yeah. So it took 15 hours of time lapsing, but that's how a plaque develops. And you can see the, the cells are becoming what we call refractory to light. They're no longer transmitting the light of the microscope. They can become shiny, and that's part of the cytopathic effect. They're also detaching. The hole is getting bigger. I think this is amazing. In my opinion, this is the greatest movie ever made. It's better than any because I think the plaque assay is the most amazing assay in the world. And... Um, we continue to use it. In fact, here, this is my office, and this is these are some students from a previous uh, class of this virology class, 2019, I think. Uh, they used to come for office hours, and in my office on the wall 
are 1,600 six-well plates from a plaque assay that one of my associates did years ago. And I, I made a, uh, this, this sculpture. I glued them all to the wall. It's called the Wall of Polio because it's a polio plaque assay. But uh, we continue to do this because I think it's very powerful. And, you know, other people have gone to other methods and um, I don't think they're as good. They don't measure infectivity like PCR. We'll talk about that today. Go to the next question here on the website, which is when doing a plaque assay, what is the purpose of adding a semi-solid auger overlay on the monolayer of infected cells? All right, what's the purpose of the auger overlay? Stabilize progeny virus particles to ensure that the cells remain susceptible and permissive, to act as a pH indicator, to keep the cells adherent to the plate, to restrict viral diffusion after lysis of infected cells. And while you're doing that, I'll look at some of the questions here. Would the size of the plaque make any difference in infectivity? So in other words, are you saying, would a bigger plaque mean there's a more infectious virus? It could be, but you know, the, the agar that we use can come from different sources and the components in the agar, it's not very pure, can also influence the size of the plaque. So you can't always conclude that it is a direct uh, readout of infectivity. It's assumed that each plaque is the result of a single infection. Yes. And I'm going to show you the data for that in a moment. Is there a limit of plaque expansion? <laughs> uh, we have often forgotten our plaque assays in the incubator and they get bigger and bigger and eventually they meld into one another and then you can't count them. So it will keep going as long as the cells are alive and they will stay alive a long time. So, you know, poliovirus makes a plaque in two days. So if you leave it in for four days, then they're all they're all mushed together. So let's see how we did. Most of you got E, which is the right answer, to restrict viral diffusion after lysis of infected cells. That's why you put an overlay, an agar overlay on, not for any of these other reasons, to restrict diffusion. If you had a liquid overlay, as soon as the first viruses were produced from the infected cells, they would infect all the cells because they're diffusing in the medium and you couldn't count any plaques, right? So the agar keeps the virus particles restricted in their movement, that's how you get a plaque. So let's go back to uh, the dilution. All right, we have 17 plaques on the 10 to the minus sixth dilution. We put 0.1 ml on each plate, so that's another tenfold dilution. So we count 17 plaques and all you do is 17 times 10 to the dilution. So you take off the negative, and that's often what people answer on the exam. They say the titer is 1.7 times 10 to the minus eighth. No, that's the dilution. To to get the titer from the dilution, you simply remove the exponent, the negative sign on the exponent. So 17 plaques times, it would be 10 to the seventh is actually the dilution. And I just moved the decimal point over one and, it's, and that becomes eight. So it could be 1.7 times 10 to the eighth or 17 times 10 to the seventh. It's exactly the same. So this is a plaque assay from my lab. That's beautiful, right? The cells are stained with crystal violet. So the living cells take up the dye, they're purple, and wherever there's a plaque, um, the cells are dead, so there's nothing to stain. These are, these are actually influenza viruses. And you can see tenfold dilutions from left to right. And I would count this one in the middle to get the titer. So how many viruses do you need to form a plaque? That was one of the questions. And so there's a very simple experiment you can do, and that's what Renato Dolbeco did in his paper that I showed you. He did a, a uh, um, dose response curve. That's the, that's the words I was looking for. So you basically make dilutions of virus and you put them on cells. And with increasing amounts of virus, you count the plaques. So in this graph on the y-axis is number of plaques. You just do a plaque assay with dilutions of virus. And here is the, the relative virus concentration. Basically, we're getting more and more concentrated from left to right. And if one virus is enough to make a plaque, then the line is going to be straight line. For, it's called one hit kinetics because the number of plaques is directly proportional to the first power of the concentration of the virus. So you double the virus, you double the number of plaques, right? That gives you a straight line. And Dubeco found when he did this for his virus in that first paper, it was a line. So he said, you need one, one virus particle to make a plaque. Some viruses though, you need two to infect a cell. They're really interesting plant viruses where the genome is in two pieces and they're packaged separately. So both have to infect the cell. And that, that's two hit kinetics. The number of plaques is proportional to the square of the concentration. So you get this, this curve because you need two particles 
to infect the cell. So most viruses are one hit, uh, but there are a few uh, interesting plant viruses that are two. Okay, one, one infectious virus is enough to form a plaque. Now, we often use plaque assays to purify and make clonal virus stocks. It's called plaque purification. You do a plaque assay, and here's agar on top, and you can often see these plaques without staining them. So you just take a pipette, and you plunge it into the agar above a plaque, and that picks up some of the virus. You can then resuspend it in buffer and repeat this a few times, and, and we... We do that, well, it's called plaque purification because you're using the virus in a plaque. And the idea being, let's say you took a, a nasal wash from a patient and you plaqued it out and you got plaques. You couldn't rule out that there were, by accident, two viruses making one plaque, just infecting neighboring cells. So you just do this multiple times to rule out and get a, a purified stock of your virus. Now, many viruses don't form plaques. So we have other assays to measure infectivity, and we typically use endpoint dilution assays. And here we're using cytopathic effect to look for viruses infecting cells. So you take a 96-well plate, and you make dilutions of your virus, just as in a plaque assay, your minus 2 through minus 7. And in this 96-well plate, you infect each row with uh, the same dilution of virus. So there's all replicates. And then you do minus three and the next minus four. And then you put this in the incubator. And then in, in a few days, you take it out and you look for cytopathic effect in the microscope. You can see if cells are dying, which tells you that uh, the virus is reproducing in them. And you put a plus wherever there's CPE. So you can see here at low dilutions, they're all showing CPE. But then at minus four, you start to see here's one negative. And then minus five, there are multiple negatives. And then more and more negatives as you dilute out the virus because there's less virus to infect the cells. And you can use statistical procedures to calculate what we call the 50% endpoint. It's typically what we want to know. How much uh, virus will cause, or the amount of virus that will cause CPE in 50% of the cultures. And here it happens to fall on 10 to the minus five. There are one, two, three, four, five pluses and five minuses. Uh, usually it doesn't fall exactly like that and you have to do some extrapolation, but the principle is the same. Here we would say the 50% uh, concentration in this virus is 10 to the 5. It's a strictly dilution-based uh, calculation. You don't get plaque forming units per mil. We get what we call, say, cell culture infectious dose 50%. Now, a further complication in measuring and studying viruses is that not all particles that a cell makes are infectious. And we, we describe that, but what it's called the particle to PFU ratio. It's very simple. You take the number of infectious particles, which you can calculate in a plaque assay, and you divide it by the, into the number of physical particles. Okay, and this tells you the ratio of physical to infectious. So for some viruses, it's very high. There are a lot of non-infectious particles. So here the ratio for these viruses, papillomaviruses, is 10,000. So that means only one in 10,000 particles made by a cell is infectious. For other viruses, it's close to one. Almost every particle made in a cell is infectious, and other viruses are in between. It's very important to consider this because if you're doing experiments and say looking in cells in a microscope, electron microscope, you don't know if what you're looking at is actually representative of what is uh, infecting the cell. Someone just asked a question for cytopathic end, endpoint dilution assays. Is there usually a clear, clear degradation? Yes. So you, it's usually plus or minus CPE, but you have to stop at you know a certain number of days and make it constant. Because if you don't see a CPE at two days, it's possible in five days you would. So you have to standardize your assay. Let's talk a little bit more about this particle to PFU ratio. What this means, I've told you already that a single particle can make a plaque, right? So a single particle can initiate infection, but not all viruses are successful. So it's not contradictory at all. And why not? Many virus preparations are damaged. Here's an electron micrograph of a poliovirus preparation, and you can see there are empty particles in it. So just in the process of making uh, the virus preps, you can damage them. We think mutations, and as you'll see later, mutations occur at every reproduction step. Um, this could introduce lethal mutations into a particle. And also the infectious cycle is complex. You have to go through seven, eight, nine, ten steps. And if you fail at any one step, 
you don't get infectivity. So all these reasons uh, explain this particle to PFU ratio, which can be high for some viruses or low for others. In particle to PFU ratio, particle can best be described as one of the proteins which makes up the virus, a virus which may or may not be infectious, a virus which is infectious, a virus which is not infectious, elementary, or composite. All right, let's see what happens here. 75% of you got B, which is right. A particle just means anything that can or cannot be infectious. It's everything, right? You think of it as everything. It's both infectious and non-infectious particles. And you want to know what fraction of that are infectious, right? So it's not the proteins. It's not just infectious. Infectious is measured by the plaque assay, right? It's the PFU part of the equation. It's And it's not... Non-infectious and elementary or composite is a throwaway, right? It's physics. It has nothing to do with virology. Sometimes we do that. See, um, let me go back to that formula for the you know, number of physical particles over the number of infectious particles. So the particle can be either one and the physical or infectious is being specific. Let's talk about now using the growth cycle to, to study what goes on in a cell. And this is called the one-step growth cycle, which was originally developed in 1939 uh, by two virologists who were studying bacteriophages. And I mentioned this on Monday. This was the, a key experiment that showed that viruses were not simply small bacteria. And this is the experiment they did. They take a, a virus stock, they allow the virus to stick to the bacteria, which we call adsorption. You add the virus to the bacteria. Then you dilute the culture, which stops any further attachment of viruses. And then you put it in the incubator and you sample and measure virus production over time by plaque assay. And so what's the result? This is the growth cycle. So here on the left uh, is what we call a single step because we have infected all the cells. And how you know that, I'll tell you in a moment. And then uh, we're, put, we're plotting on the y-axis the number of infectious particles, PFU per mil, and time is on the x-axis. So you infect your cells and then you dilute the culture and start the incubation. And you take time points here. And for a while, you don't see any new virus being made. That's the eclipse period because what's happening is the genome is getting out of the particle and it's being made into mRNA. Proteins are made and being assembled. And then at some point in the infectious cycle, you start to see new virus particles made and that's called the burst or the yield of the infection. And eventually it plateaus as you kill all the cells, for example. So that's one step because all the cells are infected and they all go through the same thing at the same time. And you can imagine that's very powerful experimentally because if you want to study some process, you have now an amplification of it because it's happening in every cell at the same time. Now, if you add less virus to begin with, you infect fewer cells. So on the left, we infected all the cells if we add less virus, fewer cells are infected. So we again have an eclipse period, but then there's there are multiple bursts. You have the first burst because only a fraction of the cells are infected. And those viruses that are made then go out and infect other cells and so on and so forth. Second burst, you can have multiple bursts depending on how little virus you add to the cell. Uh, this is an example of a growth curve for an animal virus, adenovirus, which is a human virus causes respiratory infections, gastrointestinal infections, and it has been used as a vector to make some of the COVID-19 vaccines. We'll talk about that later on. And again, same idea. You infect the culture, uh, you dilute it to start it, you incubate it and take time points, PFU per mil versus hours after adsorption. And you can see there's an eclipse period here. And then at about 12 hours for this virus, you start to detect virus particles made. There's an additional uh, complexity here which is because what they did uh, in this experiment was they didn't just look at all the viruses produced in a cell, but all the viruses released from the cell. In the previous experiment with E. coli, they just took the whole E. coli culture and ground it up and looked for virus. But here they have said, what's released? So we look in the cell culture medium and what is the total virus production? So here is extracellular virus, this gold line here. And you see there's a delay between when the first viruses are made in the cell. So the purple and the, the, the red line is the intracellular virus. So the intracellular virus starts to go up after 12 hours, but you don't see anything in the medium until 16 hours. And so that defines what we call a latent period, meaning that's 
takes that much time for the virus to get out of cells once it's made. It just takes time for a virus once it's made inside the cell to break open the cell or get out in some other way. So in this curve, we have extracellular virus and intracellular is red and total is purple. And, you know, the intracellular is, is the vast majority. And that's why the total and intracellular are similar. And I mean, remember, I want to remind you, in this experiment, we take one virus, infect the cell, all the parts are made, we assemble many viruses, which are then released. It's contrast to bacteria, which divide by binary fission. You put one bacterium in a culture, it becomes two, four, eight, and so on. So very different uh, ways of reproducing. And the growth curve was what pointed that out originally in 1949. Now, this idea of infecting all, how can intracellular viruses form plaques? You, you actually don't have to get out of a cell before, like you just need to kill the cell, right? But you're saying, how does it make the plaque? Because it doesn't spread from cell to cell. Some viruses can spread without getting outside. They spread from cell to cell by fusion. And so they can make a plaque uh, in that way as well. To do this one-step growth curve, we need to infect all of the cells. How do we know if all the cells are infected? And this is uh, addressing the topic of multiplicity of infection. This is the number of particles you add per cell. So you, it's the amount of virus in PFU divided by the number of cells. It is not what each cell receives, because what you add and what each cell receives is different. So, for example, you add 10 to the seventh particles to a million cells. That's an MOI of 10, but each cell does not receive 10 particles. So that's an important distinction. And the actual number of particles each cell gets when you add different amounts of viruses is uh, determined by a, a formula. And it's a random event because infection depends on random collision of viruses in cells. And when you add viruses to cells. Some are uninfected. Some get one particle, some two get three or four or more. And that, that distribution, how many, how many particles get into different cells is, is determined by the Poisson distribution. I look at it as tennis, as a tennis problem. I, I don't play tennis, but this is a good way to describe it. You take a box of tennis balls and you have a bunch of buckets and you throw out all the tennis balls at once. They're Buckets are not going to get one ball each. Some will get none. Some will get one or two or three. The same thing with viruses uh, infecting cells. So here's the Poisson distribution, and that's the curve described by that equation. And we can use this to figure out how many viruses each cell receives. So PK is the fraction of cells infected with K virus particles, and M is the multiplicity of infection. So that's what all the the letters are, and E, of course, is the natural logarithm. And so we can simplify this actually to this. If you want to know how many uninfected cells there are in a culture, that's P0. It's simply E to the minus M, where M is the multiplicity. Really simple. You could take E, you put it in your calculator, E minus 1, and you can figure out the percent of cells getting uninfected when you have an MOI of 1 or 5 or 10, whatever you want. And if you want to know how many cells get one particle, it's this m times e to the minus m, and m is multiplicity, e is the natural log. And if you want to know multiply infected cells, that is what uh, cells get more than one virus particle, it's this formula, 1 minus e to the minus m times m plus 1. And that's basically uh, you're subtracting from 1 the sum of all probabilities for any value of k, p0 and p1. So you're subtracting from 1, P0, and P1 to get P greater than 1. But in practice, it's very simple. Here are some examples. We take a million cells in each of these plates. Uh, we infect at a multiplicity of 10. That means you're putting 10 to the seventh PFU on the cells. And if you use that formula, you'll see 45 cells are uninfected. 450 cells get one particle, and the rest get more than one. That's why at a high MOI, we can do a one-step growth curve because all the cells are infected. You do an MOI of one, now 37% of the cells get one particle and 26% get more than one. So you're not infecting all the cells now. You're 37% uninfected. So you probably have two steps. 
You could even go down to 0.001. It depends what you want to do. If you want one cycle or multiple cycles, here at mono MOI of 0.001, which is a, a thousand PFU on a million cells, 99.9% .9 of the cells are infected, but some get one or more particles. So there will be a few infected cells. And if you are patient and wait, eventually they will spread through the culture. So that is how you figure out how many cells are infected. So our last question today is, if cells are infected at an MOI of 10 in a one-step growth curve, in the growth curve, you will likely see A, multiple bursts of virus release, B, multiple eclipse periods, C, a single burst of virus release, D, no burst, E, asynchronous infection. Okay, let's see what happened here. Most of you, 80% got C, a single burst of virus release. Right, MOI of 10, all the cells or almost all the cells are infected. You're going to have a one-step growth, so you're going to have a single burst. A lot of you picked A, multiple bursts. You would see multiple if you did a low MOI, like one or below. But 10 is high, All, but according to that formula, which I just showed you, um, all, all the cells are, most of the cells are infected. And I'll show you to you again. You're an MOI of 10. Um, <laughs> only, you know, 500 cells are going to, 45 uninfected cells, basically. So most cells are infected. So it's going to be one step growth curve. So that's infectivity measurement. Do you need to know how to use formulas? Uh, if uh, if I put a formula on an exam, um, it will be that one, which is very simple. And you can bring a calculator with, you can have a calculator. You're not coming to class this year. Um, and, you know, the constants, there's only two constants. There's the natural log E and M is the multiplicity. That's all you have to know. You'll have this on the, the study questions. There's some practicing. All right, physical measurements of particles. We've talked about infectivity. You can do a, a variety of these. And these some of these are now uh, also relevant to SARS-CoV-2. You can do plaque assays of SARS-CoV-2, by the way. But it has to be done in a, in a high containment lab, BSL-3, which not everybody has. Uh, so we're going to talk about hemagglutination assays. Electron microscopy, you could count particles, but you need an EM. Not everybody has that. Um, you can measure viral enzymes. You can do serology, use antibodies, or you can do nucleic acid-based assays. Hemagglutination was originally developed for influenza viruses because they, didn't, they hadn't had a plaque assay until the 50s, I suppose, or 40s or 50s. And what you do here, you take advantage of the fact that the virus can bind red blood cells. The virus does not infect them, but just binds to them. But red blood cells are big. And when viruses, uh, the influenza viruses bind them, the red blood cells tend to stick together and make clumps. So you make twofold dilutions of your virus and you mix them with red blood cells and you put them in these uh, 96 well plates where the well is not flat, but it's curved. So the if the red blood cells are not bound up by the virus, they will fall and make a button here in the bottom. So you can see sample C has no virus in it because the red blood cells are all falling to the bottom. But sample D has virus in it. We, we say this, this virus is hemagglutinating, and you can count up to the dilution where the hemagglutination stops, and you go back one. So this virus would have an HA titer of 512. This doesn't tell you anything about infectivity. It just tells you the number of particles that are present. But it's useful if you want to quickly know if, if you've grown your influenza virus up in eggs properly. Many uh, viruses have enzymes in the particle. And next time I'm going to tell you how you can just know the kind of nucleic acid that's present and, and make a good um, detection of what's going on there. Now, um, this is a retrovirus that has an enzyme called reverse transcriptase in it. And um, the enzyme can be assayed. If you crack open these particles and add some radioactive uh, nucleotides, uh, you can make a DNA copy and you can measure that uh, in an assay. This is a, a, a Western blot, not Western, excuse me. This is a membrane filter through which you've filtered the products of, uh, of an assay. And here we have cells different times after infection. 
And in the middle, they're infected with a retrovirus. And you can see as time goes on, we're getting increased incorporation of radioactivity uh, into a product that's stuck on the filter, which means it's a DNA product. And if you make a dilution, you see you get less product. So we can directly measure uh, enzymes in a variety of viruses as a surrogate, again, for the number of virus particles. We use many different uh, immunological assays to measure either viral proteins or uh, or antibodies against them. And these are called enzyme-linked immunosorbent assays or ELISAs. In this uh, assay, we're actually trying to measure viral antigen. This could be in saliva. It could be in blood. You want to know if there's an ongoing infection, which would be viral proteins are made. So you take a, a plastic support, like one of those 96 well uh, dishes, you attach an antibody to the viral antigen. And these now you can buy. Every Many companies sell antibodies to whatever viral protein you want. You attach the uh, antibody, and then you can pass your sample over these plates. And if there's viral antigen in the sample, the antigen will be captured by the antibody. And it should actually be capture, not captured antibody. Every year I, I notice this and I forget to fix it. It's called a capture antibody because it's capturing the antigen. And then, so how do you know the, the antigen's there? Then you use the second antibody to your viral protein, which has some kind of an indicator on it, a, a fluorescent indicator or a, you know, a, a protein that will make a chemical detectable and so forth. And you can tell if uh, you're, you have viral antigen. And I'm going to show you an example of, you know, at home lateral flow assay uh, that, that can do this. Very, very much like a pregnancy assay. You're basically using antibodies to capture a hormone in urine and using a second antibody to detect it. In this case, we're doing viral antigens. You can also look for antibodies in your blood. Uh, if you think you were infected some time ago, you have antibody. Um, and uh, you can detect them. In this case, you put antigen on the solid support. You put serum in the test. And if you have antibodies to uh, the viral protein in your blood, they will bind. And then you use a second antibody, an anti-IgG, which with an indicator to detect them. And someone write, wrote, is this the COVID rapid test? So there are both nucleic acid and uh, antibody rapid tests and antigen rapid tests. So all of them rapid meaning less than an hour. Okay. And so nucleic acid, antigen, and antibody COVID tests can all be rapid. And I want to show you how these kinds of tests were used to uh, um, look at the first SARS-CoV-2. So again, this is from that first paper. Remember, they had did a uh, bronchial alveolar lavage from a patient. They put it on cells. They saw cytopathic effect. And then they took those infected cells and stained them with an antibody, which they had to a coronavirus protein that's known to be conserved among different coronaviruses, a nucleoprotein. They had an antibody in the lab. This lab works on coronaviruses. And they put, they took their infected cells and they they permeabilize them so the antibody can get in with methanol or some such substance. They add the antibody to NP and then they add a second antibody with an indicator. And here you can see the indicator is fluorescing red and it's showing you that these cells are infected. They're making the nuclear protein. So a direct uh, illustration of what I just showed you. So here's a lateral flow assay where you, I don't happen to have one here, but they're little cartridges, no bigger than a microscope slide. They're plastic. And uh, it's like you can buy these for pregnancy tests. They're a little longer because you have to urinate on, on one end. But basically the idea is here, here we're looking for antigen, but you can configure this to look for antibody as well. So here's your clinical sample with antigen. You put it on, a, on an absorbent pad at one end. It begins to move across the slide by capillary flow. And at one end, we have uh, monoclonals to your antibody that are linked to colloidal gold so that we can see them making a line later on. So the if there's uh, antigen in the sample, it will combine with these antibodies and move down. And you can see them here in the middle of the slide. The red are the viral proteins. 
And then they, they reach the other end of the assay where there are capture antibodies. And there are two, two lines of antibody. One is a control line, which will just make sure the test is working. And that will pick up uh, the antibody by itself. So here you can see these uh, antibodies on the slide are binding to the bottom of the antibody. So these are anti-IgG. It doesn't matter whether there's an antigen on them or not. So that tells you the test worked very much like a pregnancy test. There's an internal control. And then the other line, the antibodies are against the viral antigen or the viral protein. So the red here is binding to that antibody. So it's capturing this whole thing. And because there's colloidal gold here, it makes a dark line that you can see visually. And so you put your drop here, 15 minutes, the assay is done. And uh, I, I made a, I took one of these for SARS-CoV-2 and, and I made a video of it, which I'll give you a link to in a moment. We also use green fluorescent protein and many variants of it in virology. So GFP, of course, was originally uh, discovered in a jellyfish and um, it's been modified to be all different colors. Here's, here's one, here's an experiment with a virus infected cell where there, I think there are seven different colors uh, present in the, in different virus particles. Uh, here on the left, you can incorporate GFP uh, into virus particles. And now you can see them in a light microscope because the light makes the particles visible, right? So these green dots are HIV particles labeled with GFP. And you can do real-time experiments. You can watch viruses move within cells. These are actually HIV particles within a cell. And these are the microtubule networks uh, on which the virus has moved, getting to the nucleus. Incredible amounts of microscopy made possible by uh, use of GFP. We can also use nucleic acid approaches. We can do sequencing. Nowadays, we do deep, high-throughput sequencing. We take a sample. We can take water. We can take sewage. We can take your nasal wash and sequence everything that's in it. Uh, and we use this, as I told you last time, to identify new viruses, pathogens, the uh, bronchial alveolar lavage wash that I told you about of SARS-CoV-2 patient was not only used to put on the cells, but they sequenced it and found what virus is in it. And this has become very cheap. You know, the human genome took 10 years to sequence originally when it was first done years ago, it cost $3 billion. You can now sequence a human genome in one day for less than $1,000. This is how this technology is emerging. So that's deep high throughput sequencing. And by the way, this is not deep, this high throughput sequencing. This is what I used to do, running uh, gels to do sequencing, which takes much longer. If for an example, I, I sequenced the genome of poliovirus in 1980. It's a genome of 7,400 bases of RNA. It took me one year. Today, you could do it in 30 minutes. You just send it to a company and they would do it quickly. Now, when you have these sequences, um, and, and I'll probably go a few minutes over, and those of you who have to leave, that's fine. I will keep talking so we have the recording, obviously. You can take the sequences and make phylogenetic trees, and we're going to use these a bit in this course. So let me explain what they are. You take, let's say you have 10 virus isolates from 10 different patients, and you want to know how they're related to one another. Say they're all, they're all SARS-CoV-2, but you want to somehow track where they came from. So you use computer programs to compare them, the sequences, and you, you arrange them on a tree uh, in, according to which are paired better with each other. So for example, virus nine and 10 here, they cluster together better than with any other of the viruses on this phylogenetic tree. And one and two cluster better than all the others, okay? The other thing that you get from a tree is that from left to right, you have more genetic change. And so, for example, uh, virus one and two have a common ancestor, which you don't necessarily have, uh, which gave rise to both of those. And in turn, uh, virus one, two, three, and four had a common ancestor as well. And you can go from left to right is time of circulation. And this is usually the number of changes per length of sequence that's given down here, de degree of genetic tame change from left to right. At the very end, at the left, there is the root of the tree, and that's the presumed ancestor of all the viruses, and you, and you never have this virus, 
you know, for, for SARS-CoV-2, the root is decades old. We don't have it. But we can infer the root by looking at the degree of genetic change. And sometimes you have these intermediate viruses that you can put in the tree as well. So here's the first phylogenetic tree made for SARS-CoV-2 back in January of 2020. It's from the same paper that I showed you uh, before where they isolated the virus. They determined the whole genome sequence, 30,000 nucleotides. And they made a phylogenetic tree using known sequences of other coronaviruses. Bat coronaviruses, you can see throughout this tree, uh, MERS coronavirus, etc. Here's human corona 229E, which is a common cold corona. And here, let's see, here is the, in red is um, that SARS-CoV-2 isolated in Wuhan in the beginning of uh, 2020. And you can tell from uh, this, this graph, I'm looking for, so here's MERS coronavirus, which is another human coronavirus. It's quite distant. It's another common cold coronavirus. Um, the closest um, relative was a bat virus called RATG13, which was isolated in 2013 from a cave outside Wuhan. This is 96% identical in the genome sequence to SARS-CoV-2. The uh, uh, SARS-1, which was identified in 2003, was even more distant. Um, it is it is not on this graph because it all of these are much closer than that one was. So this can tell you that this virus is related to coronaviruses circulating in bats. And of course, you can do much more with this. You can, there there is a wonderful website where. All the sequences that have been made of SARS-CoV-2 from tens of thousands of patients are put on phylogenetic trees, and you can track how they spread across the globe and so forth. Really good stuff. The last thing I want to tell you about is polymerase chain reaction. So PCR has revolutionized our research, our, our making of products, uh, our ability to diagnose infections. And this all began with a bacteria that grows in hot springs. And in the 60s, a microbiologist by the name of Tom Brock was working on these bacteria. He was interested to know how they grew at high temperatures. And from those bacteria, a DNA polymerase was isolated. This bacteria was called Thermus aquaticus. And the uh, polymerase was called TAC. And that's a, a high temperature resistant polymerase. It'll work, it'll stay active at high temperatures. And so that's how PCR was developed, where you take, you have some sample where you have some nucleic acid in it, typically DNA or, or RNA. If you do a reverse transcription reaction first, uh, you can turn the RNA into DNA. Then you add nucleotides and some primers, some primers that are complementary to what you're looking for. Then you denature the DNA, you put it at 100 degrees, and the TAC polymerase works. After that, you anneal the primer, and then the TAC polymerase makes a product. So now you have two copies where you we originally had one, and you repeat it. You go multiple cycles. You cool it, and then you do the polymerase, and you heat it to denature these, and then you get four and eight and 16. And eventually, you can detect very small quantities of uh, something in a clinical specimen, or you can amplify genes. You can do many, many things with this. So... This has uh, become a problem with many viruses because uh, it, the assumption is often made that whatever you pick up by PCR is actually infectious virus, but it's not. As you know already from this course, infectious virus can be picked up only by infectivity assays. And here's a, an experiment that emphasizes this. This was done with Zika virus a number of years ago. And these are experiments where mice were infected uh, with Zika virus, they, they wanted to look at sexual transmission of the virus in mice. So they're looking at uh, male mice here, they're infected, and they're, they're measuring virus in seminal fluids by either PCR, and that's Zika RNA, that's this dark line here, or by infectivity assay. And these are days after infection. So you infect the mice here, and then you harvest seminal fluid, you do either PCR or um, plaque assay. And look, the infectious virus peaks at about day 12, and then by day 21, it is gone. But you can find Zika RNA by PCR for 60 days after infection. And you can find it in people 
people, men who have recovered from Zika virus infection, you can find RNA in the semen for a long time. And for a long time, we weren't sure if we should do something about that because it's not necessarily infectious virus. So for many RNA viruses, it turns out, you can find RNA long after the disappearance of infectious virus. And SARS-CoV-2 is no exception. Here's a graph of similar data that I've just showed you for Zika for SARS-CoV-2. So we're looking at days after infection and uh, the y-axis is either infectivity, infectious SARS-CoV-2 in the blue curve, or RNA detected by PCR. And you can see, in this case, you know, by 12 days or so, there's no more infectious virus in the nasopharyngeal wash of this, these patients. This is a uh, s summary of a number of patients. Yet they remain PCR positive. And you can go PCR positive, depending on how severe your disease is, you may be PCR positive for months, but you're not infectious, you're not transmitting. And you know, early in this outbreak, if you were PCR positive, you had to be quarantined for two weeks. But many people are positive without being shedding. And how do you figure that out? How do you know to distinguish between those people? And the key is how the PCR works. It has to do with cycle threshold. So when you do PCR, Nowadays, with each cycle, right, you add your primers, you denature, you do the polymerase reaction, then you denature, go through the cycle. Every cycle, you're getting more and more nucleic acid. Uh, the way you design PCR assays is you can put a dye in the protocol so that the dye is either incorporated or intercalates into the DNA as it made. And then you use a detector to measure at each cycle the amount of DNA by this dye. Okay, and so you can uh, that you get a measure of how much DNA is present by measuring the fluorescence. So here is a graph of a PCR reaction where we're looking at fluorescence versus the number of cycles. And there's usually a background of fluorescence. And then when you exceed the background, now you've got product and you call that the cycle threshold or CT. You can go 11 cycles before you get a signal. You can go 15, 20 37. So which which one correlates with infectivity? So on the right here is a graph summarizing a number of patients where we're looking at cycle threshold in blue versus the probability of being culture positive. That is taking the nasopharyngeal wash, which you've done a PCR on, put it in cell culture and seeing if there's infectious virus there. So you can see after about seven days, these are symptom to test. Uh, you no longer are culture positive. But you do have PCR positivity, but these cycle thresholds are quite high. And now we think that, uh, you know, when you're in the exponential phase of SARS-CoV-2 reproduction in your upper tract, you have cycle thresholds of 12, 15, 20. But if you are 34 and higher, you are not infectious. You're not going to transmit. And the FDA has only recently started to say you can, companies can provide the cycle threshold to to try and do patient management. Because in fact, not only is it important for quarantine, but it turns out if you have um, a cycle threshold of below 22, right? The lower the cycle threshold, the more RNA you have, right? It's kind of counterintuitive. If you're below 22, you're gonna, you may have a poor clinical prognosis. So CT is really important. So um, I had a, a, at Columbia, we have to have routine uh, PCR tests, nasopharyngeal swabs. And, and back in, I don't know, September, I had a positive test, but they gave me the CT value and it was 37. And I knew I was, it was either a false positive or uh, I was at the end of an infection, but I had no symptoms and unlikely to be infected. I repeated it two days later and it was negative. So I talked about cycle threshold and being positive or not in, in this video. And then to seal it, a company sent me a rapid antibody test. Here's the cartridge here. It's a little guy. And that's the, the lateral flow assay that I just described to you. And I ran that on my serum. You know, you just take a, it comes with a little needle. You take a sample of blood from your finger, put it on there. 10 minutes, I had no antibodies to SARS-CoV-2, never infected. But you can see the control line there.
So both of these videos are kind of informative if you want to understand cycle threshold and uh, how these uh, antibody tests work. The next time we're going to start going into the viral genome, genomes and genetics, we're going to look at all the different kinds of viral genomes, what kind of viruses they're present in, and what does it mean uh, for the study of virology. Thank you.